because I know in my heart, I, I was very close to Michael, and I know in my heart that Michael was murdered by the police. Plus, I have many bits of proof that I've seen over the past two weeks that verifies this accusation. He was so sweet, I don't know why they did it. I don't know why. I hate violence. I hate violence and I don't know why they killed him. But they're not going to get away with it, that's for sure. I thought he was really cute, so I let him dance in my video. He, he made one really strong impression on me, and that was that he was really fragile. Um, um, racism didn't end after the 60s. I think we're talking more, I think we're talking about more than police brutality. I think we're talking more, I think we're talking about more than, than a close friend of everybody's, you know, he's killed senselessly. It would be foolish to think that people would ever, like, get over their prejudices about the race, the color of a person's skin. Uh, APO, Rod Rodriguez, 10th Precinct, shoot number 1664. The incident began at 2.51, 2.51 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And at 3.22, yeah. which is which is 30, 31 minutes later, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. 31 minutes later, they were at Bellevue and the prisoner was in Bellevue. We want to know what happened during that hour, you understand? Yeah. So, look, it, this could be a uh, uh, torture to show the, the other graffiti, not to paint in the subway. Many know? officers? Yeah. Well, it was the original uh, arresting officer who came upon, who found him, uh, who saw him writing graffiti on the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two other officers who accompanied the arresting officer in the patrol car. One was the driver of the patrol car, and the other was was a um, the recorder, uh, the person who rides in the seat next to the driver. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also on the scene two police, transit police officers who were from uh, one of our emergency medical rescue vans. That emergency medical rescue van responded to the scene when the officer at, radio, at first radioed for help because he felt he had, when he felt that Stewart was going to be a problem. So there were two officers there. There were five, five. transit police officers. I don't think Michael uh, knew what was going to hit, you know, I don't think, because it was a surprise fault, you know, the way the cops come, you know, grab them like this, mm -hmm. throw them against the concrete floor. He didn't expect that, I but guess. The head was on his back, so imagine when he falls, uh, like that, as you can see. Ran up the stairs, and right at the top of the stairs at 14th Street, he fell to the sidewalk. Yeah, he didn't fall downstairs, he really fell. I mean, this guy threw him down. It's a different from fell and threw. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that he threw him down against the concrete floor. Understand? He, see? So you clear the last step. There is no, so he can't trip. If he, if he trips, he will fall forward. But the plants are grabbed and threw him this way, down. So it means uh, like that. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. What he threw him was more like, like I said. When he threw him, threw him he threw him against the so we had one officer on top of him. And then when the other officer rolled him, and 
slap them. See, then he grabbed them like that. Then he let them drop again. Then they stand up. You know? Mm hmm. As you can see. The medical van responded not because it was a medical van, but because it had because it had police officers in it. These are police officers. Besides their medical training, they're they're uh, trained to uh, perform police duties. One officer told him something. And then he walked over to Michael Stewart. Just the other, the, the officer was on top of him. Got off. He comes and turns Michael Stewart over. He comes and slaps him, and then he grabs him and sees his face. Mm -hmm. Then he let him go, and then, then when the officer started closing in, uh, they started closing in, you know, because they were aware that we were watching. And then I can imagine what was really happening, you know, I'm aware that they're kicking this, that, you know, Michael Stewart's butt, you know what I mean? They had him for about 10 minutes, then they stand him up. Stewart was put into the back of the patrol car and they proceeded to the Union Square. The medical van uh, followed along with them mm -hmm. and so it was on hand in the Union Square area when they had to uh, restrain Stewart. He was kicking violently. So. In fact, it was the two officers from the medical van that supplied the bandages, the gauze, medical gauze that was used to bind up his ankles. According to the log, it looks like it looks like uh, ten minutes in the Union Square area parking area. Mm -hmm. After they bound up his uh, feet, mm -hmm. they put him back into the. Uh, radio car to bring him over to uh, Bellevue Hospital. Mm -hmm. And then in the Bellevue car, he lapsed into a coma. Yeah, we're not uh, sure exactly uh, where he, where that happened, whether he was still in the car. Uh, the officers think that he was still uh, conscious when they arrived at Bellevue, but they didn't really, you know, they had no reason to I think he was unconscious uh, when they arrived, but when they got there, the nur a nurse pointed out that uh, he appeared to be unconscious. We're really not sure just when he lapsed into unconsciousness, whether he was still in the car, whether he was being taken from the car to the into the emergency room, or whether it was in the emergency room. He was handcuffed, uh, hands behind him. Um, he also had his leg and feet cuffed, also tied with a rag. His face was pressed down in the stretcher padding. I looked at his hands, they were blue, and I said to the police officer, his hands are blue, can you loosen this a bit? Then I looked down at his face, his, I said, God damn, his face is blue too, let's get him inside. It took at least three minutes, maybe five minutes to get the cuffs off. Then we were able to turn him over on his back and get his clothes off. And his injuries were, to my eye, were entirely consistent with the injuries a person would receive who was in a wrestling match on a New York City sidewalk. There was absolutely no evidence of any beating of any kind. He had bruises on both sides of his forehead and swelling, um, evidence of uh, very forceful blows. Now in this business about any kind of hemorrhaging from the eyes, I was very specific about looking at his eyes. His eyes were absolutely clear. The professional, it appeared to me that he was very brutally beaten. At that time, the evidence of, of uh, multiple contusions and abrasions over virtually every aspect of his body, including his neck, in the absence of any clinical evidence of any other organic disease, together with the episodes of cardiac and respiratory failure and evidence of enormous damage to the central nervous system made the initial impression of the application of extraordinary force to his neck and body my first uh, diagnosis.
One second, please. An autopsy was performed upon the body of Michael J. Stewart beginning at 1.30 p.m. and concluding at 8.15 p.m. The cause of death is cardiac arrest with survival for 13 days, bronchopneumonia, pending further study. The autopsy disclosed findings consistent with the hospital course of coma following a cardiac arrest. While there was evidence of healing injuries on the body, the autopsy demonstrated no evidence of physical injury resulting or contributing to death. Further tests, including examination of the brain and spinal cord, and microscopic tests will be performed. The Transit Police Department is uh, very relieved that the, uh, at the, uh, re that the report of the uh, medical examiner has cleared the air of these uh, very serious allegations of uh, police brutality. Is there a misunderstanding here? Uh, am I understanding you correctly? I asked you a moment ago whether or not you wanted to tell me what other professor was with medical examiner. Thought the response was perfect. Am I wrong? There might have been a misunderstanding. No. You did, Sergeant. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the yeah, you spoke about the autopsy, but he is about to come out here to talk to us. So right. I, obviously, 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 he told he talked to you about the autopsy a few moments before he came out here to talk to us. Do you think there's anything irregular about that? Not that I can see. Well, he's supposed to be the umpire in this. He's not supposed to take your side or the family's side. He's supposed to be impartial. And he had you in just before he came out to see us. Isn't that strange? Well, we said through the whole autopsy itself, so... I'm you think that there might strange. be a violation of law here? I would say no. The spirit of the law? I would say no. The impartial medical examiner? I would no. say no, no. Have you seen the press release itself yet? No, I have not. We're waiting for him. We're waiting for him right That's now. That's why we came so out here. You have no idea what the medical examiner is going to say? No, I do with regards to this particular case, there was no evidence of injury reflecting a strangulation. At the time that Dr. Gross uh, stated that Michael Stewart uh, did die of cardiac arrest, he had before him but neglected or failed to mention the fact that he did observe swelling of the brain that he did observe petechial hemorrhages in the eyes, that he did observe innumerable bruises and contusions over many aspects of his body, particularly the neck, and that he did observe that there was no other organic disease of the heart or significant disease of any other organ. This combination of observations at that time certainly would lead the prudent pathologist to yield a tentative diagnosis of death from anoxia mm -hmm. of the brain related to the application of force to the neck. Today there's a protest as a result of the illegal extraction of the eyes of Michael Stewart uh, outside the presence of his family's private forensic pathologist as was previously agreed to prior to the gross autopsy that was performed on the 29th of September. And that's basically what the demonstration is about today, to highlight the significance of this illegal act by Dr. Gross, which is a further manifestation of his cover-up uh, in this case. Dr. Gross did indeed remove the eyes and did indeed place them into the appropriate solutions for making the appropriate microscopic sections at a later date. It is widely known that this procedure does frequently wash out or blanch out the uh, small particular hemorrhages in the eyes. The little hemorrhages in the eyes are a function of, of a problem which happens when the neck is compressed. Stop protecting transit police killer! And what we are charging
teaching is that he was beaten to death. That he was beaten to death. The same way Arthur Miller was shot, was strangled to death. Louis Baez was shot 21 times. Uh, Ricky Borden, 11 years old, was killed. Clifford Glover, 10 years old, was killed. Claude Reese, 14 years old, was killed. Jay Parker, 15 year old honor student, was killed. And guess who killed them? Not some thugs or gangsters, but the people we pay to protect us. The people that you pay to protect you, sometimes the worst hands you want to fall in is the protectors. When Louis Baez's mother called him, the police for help, guess what happened? They end up pumping 21 bullets into the frail 100 pound man, young man. Peter Funchez was a 100% disabled veteran. His wife called for help. He ended up being beaten to death. So Michael Stewart is the last in a whole list of people who have been beaten, strangled, killed, shot by the people we pay to protect us. They probably do it for nothing, just because you're black. Right. right. Yeah. I could be Next. accused of something, right, right, right? And the treatment that I may receive could be similar to what happened to him. Exactly. Without them really having a meaning for what, what is going on. You know, that's, yeah. But I just feel more or less that I hope that some type of justice comes through about this. Because it shouldn't have happened that way. You know, it was a way to prevent it and avoid it. You know, okay. graffiti is not a serious crime. Right, right, right. You know, where as far as brutality or assault may have to come in. I just say that I wish that, you know, things would get better, some justice would be done for this young man because I feel it was injustice served to him. Bow, bow. As soon as they come to arrest you, they don't come out and say you're under arrest, show you a badge. They no, put no. a gun in your face. No, they don't do that shit. They don't do that no more. They put a gun in your face first, and then they tell you you're under arrest. So you have a, they don't even read your rights no more. They don't even read you the rights no more. That's against the law right there. They supposed to tell them, listen, uh, you know, you're under arrest, you're not supposed to ride in the wall, and you know, handcuff them and you know, bring them down uh, 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 to, the, to the station house. You know what I mean? Not to beat him up like that. You know, beat him up like that, like, 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 you know, like he's a real, real, real criminal. That's real messed up. And I had this friend, and he, he used to ride on the trains. And, you know, he had got shot in while he was in a layup, riding on the train. I just heard that, you know, while he was riding on the train, you know, instead of the cops telling him to stop, you know, they just, you know, they started shooting at him or whatever, you know. I, I'm a white middle class girl, and I was, I, I knew of things like this, but I was basically very ignorant to it until it came so close to home that it affected someone I love, and now I can see, I see through totally different eyes now. And the past two weeks, I've seen the most incredible conspiracy, cover up, and complete corruption. And for Michael's sake, I, I will fight this. Because I do believe that it, it had something to do with him being black, and none of us know what it is like for a young black man to be walking the streets with this kind of mentality of the police that is completely barbarian. None of us know what that feels like to see through those eyes. And like I said in my speech at the rally, the last two conscious hours of Michael Stewart's life must have been the most horrific hells humanly imaginable. I think a lot of us particularly the whites who are involved in the art world, who know what is going on, who look at the art, who listen to the hip-hop music, who watch the b-boys break dancing, really don't have any idea of what the other reality of their lives are. I think the day-to-day -day reality that a young black male has to watch out for these kind of things continually, I don't think any of the people in the art world understand the risks that these boys were really taking. I mean, they find it heroic, they find it dangerous, exhilarating, thrilling, but 
I just hope that it opens this, seeing this brutality for real, opens some people's minds as to what's really going on. See, I'm on the cover, man. Nobody catches me. See, it's the I'm TDS the squad. The TDS squad is what you call people that peace on trains. We'll, when we go to trains to do pieces, right, we don't go to scribble scrabble. We do, we go to do trains to do the colors, to do the whole car, to do the top to bottom, to do the full top to bottom. We don't go to scribble scrabble. And if the cops catch you, man, they beat you up. They fuck you up. Or they be housing in the yard, man. That's it. I never got caught in the yard, and I'm not gonna get caught because I don't be going to the yard that often to get caught. And graffiti is never gonna die. Those cops are never gonna stop the graffiti writers. And plus, after what they done to Michael Stewart, they really ain't gonna stop him now. Because me and my homeboy Knock 167 is gonna do a train dedicated to Michael Stewart. Everywhere you go, it's the talk of the day. Everywhere you go, you hear people say that the transit police, them are murderer, murderer. We can't let them get much further up, further up. Them kill Michael Stewart, the artist. Them kill Michael Stewart, the dirty bleeders. Right? So everywhere you go, make it the talk of the day. Don't let it go no further up. And let's make this the last time that we ever have to meet to sort of object to somebody being killed. Whether we be yellow, black, brown, or white. Make it the last time, right? We've had enough. Never again. Never again. pneumonia. The upper cervical transverse necrotizing myelopathy refers to a physical injury to the spinal cord in the upper neck. The ischemic cerebral necrosis refers to the condition of the brain resulting from absence of oxygen following cardiac arrest. What was the ultimate cause of death? Now, Dr. Gross refuses to say publicly. He chooses to go before a grand jury and uh, to state in secret what his theory is. Uh, that's not his job. His job is to indicate uh, what the manner of death was. He has to sign the death certificate to indicate that. And he, he has yet to do that. As we stated uh, following the uh, report of Dr. Gross on yesterday, his conclusions are riddled with amb ambiguities. We have uh, called this press conference in an attempt to aid the press and the public in sorting through the obfuscatory language of the gross final report and to introduce at least a modicum of clarity to the discussion of the cause of death of Michael J. Stewart. You're saying that the chief medical examiner is deceiving the public? It's deceiving in this manner that the importance that the important uh, findings and the ordering of important findings in the final diagnosis are not correct. It would be logical to conclude from the written statements in this autopsy that the sequence of events was the application of force or forces or pressure or pressures to the neck and other portions of the body with 
anoxia as a result of those pressures and forces. Cutting off of oxygen to the brain. Yes, sir. With swelling of the brain and hemorrhage in the brain, with um, petechial or very small hemorrhages in the eyes, with massive necrosis and death of brain tissue ensuing from that moment on and finally resulting in death by cardiac arrest 13 days later. It is um, that ordering which is important because that explains all of the findings and there was not another bit of evidence or there was not another finding in this gross autopsy report that contradicts that appraisal. The neck was compressed. The neck and it, was compressed. The neck was compressed. Could the neck be, could the, could the neck with be, a fall? No. Not would it have with, to be human pressure? Then? No, it wouldn't have to be human pressure, but it would have to be pressure against the neck maintained applied pressure. By someone applied else. pressure. It would it would take in other words, I mean, yeah. What it would take is a pressure sustained against the neck. Okay, then doctor over a period of time. Over a period of time. No, not at not not at one instant. Oh, Five, ten, twenty, well, maybe, you know, 20, 30 seconds would do it. Obtaining an indictment in a case like this is extremely difficult. Uh, we do, however, expect an indictment. Uh, we uh, insisted on an indictment in this matter. The problem is that uh, the police officers who were the witnesses to the murder uh, have immunity from prosecution if they testify before a grand jury. That's the problem we face, and that is why the medical examiner's testimony is so crucial in this case, and that's why we feel that Dr. Gross has already compromised himself and that uh, outside independent uh, experts should be brought in to testify. take the A chain home together and he'd get off and I'd take the chain the rest of the way and you know there were always cops on the A chain they would just get on the chain and be on, in a whole car the whole car would be packed and they would come and stand in front of my Bernard for whatever reason I don't you know I don't know but it always annoyed me it always bothered me that we were sort of singled out and he knew he, I would tell him, this really bugs me, or why do they always do that? There's a whole car full of people. You know, and there would be somebody drunk, or somebody even, you know, somebody who you would imagine the cops would go to, and they would even avoid them and come to us first to watch us. And Michael always said, it's all right, don't worry, you know, it's all right, don't worry about it. I think the public general, in general accepts that the police regularly off somebody, okay? But they always accept it because there's always the implication in the news that the person who got off to someone who somehow deserved it. You know what I mean? That, that somehow it's okay that they didn't get their rights as, as a citizen, that somehow they deserved it. But, and this is a case where this person did not deserve it. The few times that I did see him in an emotional situation, he always took an extremely passive role and internalized everything. One of the times when I heard that he got fired from the pyramid where he was working, a couple of months ago. The, the reason was given that he was not aggressive enough to actually be in a very active nightclub and uh, efficiently um, deal with the patients on the, the kind of high intensity level that nightlife can bring. It really tore him up, but he was even too upset to really fight back with the, the, the manager who fired him. And a week later, when he was at our house at a party, he made a um, he couldn't even look the, the guy in the face because he was still so upset about it. It just proved that he was you know, just a very calm and gentle person and was absolutely not prone to any kind of violence at all. Real happy and was telling me all the things he was doing lately. He was modeling for Diane Brill and um, was trying to get a job as a DJ in a new club and had been real prolific in his artwork and was just generally feeling real good about what he was doing. He was just such a vital human being that that's the real tragedy in this. He has a lot of friends and activities. Michael was an artist. Michael had some beautiful, beautiful works. He used to paint photographs. He did um, workings with spray paint, with magic marker, with different, different acrylics. He um, did painted photos, had photos. Like we were just talking about doing some big prints and taking regular photos and enlarging them very, very big 
and then painting all of them. So his, he was a good, he was a famous artist. He modeled for me, he's coming out in the Mexican Vogue and a couple, two of the Mexican magazines in the next two months, I think in November. He's a great model, real happy, good dancer, real fresh, real good. Um, very, very, very well liked. I mean, people just liked him. Everybody who met Michael liked Michael. Very gentle, very relaxed, very warm guy. You know, not pushing or aggressive, just relaxed and nice. All I know is that he was tortured, tortured and murdered. I just absolutely can't believe that it would happen to him. After I left the pyramid, after having a drink, we walked up this street here and we sat down. We went to talk for a little while. And he asked me if I was cold and he was going to take off his shirt. And as he was doing that, he said, I'm going to show you my shirt because everybody's been trying to see it all day. And um, it was his Peter Keith shirt and he was real proud of it. And we sat here for a while, smoked a cigarette, got up, and we walked up to First Avenue. He wanted to go to this club on West Broadway, but it was kind of late, so... Um, he said that he would take the train home. I asked him if I could give him a ride. So he said, sure. And held a taxi. And got in the taxi. And dropped him off on 14th Street and 1st Avenue. Kissed him and said, speak to you tomorrow. And he walked down the stairs and waved goodbye. That's what happened.